Red Oak 1994 confirms that for most of their existence, Douglas did not make their voice heard as Douglas about the issues in the country that were affecting them and field work conducted for this presentation again between 2001 and 2010 also supports this. This noticeable silence is a phenomenon contrary to standard practice in Trinidad, where self-declared spokesperson aggressively claim to represent sections of the masses on all issues and especially the pervasive ethnicization of said issues. But in spite of this, even when Douglas were the subjects of discussion, as happened in the national debate on Douglarization in the late 1980s, for instance, or with the mega controversy centering on Calypsonian brother Marvin's Calypso Jahaji Bai in 1996, Douglas failed to speak up as individuals or as representatives of a silent, unnumbered minority. Alternatively, they allowed themselves to be generally objectified and treated dismissively and negatively. This inability to find voice within the public arena may be linked to their general feeling of alienation and marginalization, started by the circumstances of birth and the unrelenting latent hostilities between their parent groups brought sharply into focus during the periods of contestation for political power. This feeling of alienation and marginalization is adequately captured in 1961 by Calypsonian Douglas' Split Me in Two, which highlights the predicament of the Dogler in a situation in which ethnicity was becoming more assertive and aggressive as the two major groups, and that's the Indic and the Afric, the two groups that um, the Douglas come from, sought to position themselves advantageously in the soon-to-be independent Trinidad and Tobago. But interestingly, Douglas' feelings of alienations and margin, alienation and marginalis marginalization also appear to be perpetuated by the absence of an ancestral, or better, of one ancestral homeland, which functions as a symbolic homeland and source of inspiration and consolation for the formation of a separate Douglas identity. Unlike other recognized ethnic groups, Douglas lack an organization and a headquarters. In fact, they are denied the corporate identity because of what Schilling East describes as the dominant culture's belief that the authentic tribal groups must be of homogenous rather than multi-tribal origin. It is quite possible that the failure on the part of officialdom to re register the Douglas as a group may have resulted in the failure of the Douglas to recognize themselves as such. Lacking official recognition and sharing the categories mixed and other with individuals of any of a numerous permutations possible for so many years may have been an, a factor in their failure to declare themselves an ethnic group or a biracial minority. This alienation felt within the public sphere during these years following independence, transfers into the private space. Mixed individuals, and Douglas in particular, have always been free to choose the group to which they feel akin or the group to which accommodates them. On the other hand, some Douglas negotiate both ancestral communities with ease, while others feel uncomfortable in both camps. This is a choice which appears to be indexed to issues of upbringing, other personal circumstances and experiences. Some circumstances are so traumatic, however, that Douglas opt to alienate themselves from either ancestral groups. Rahim 2007, for instance, explains how the Douglas father's predicament. She says, and I quote, Trinidadian was the only identity to which he would subscribe, not Indian or African or Dogla. She adds, end of quote, she adds that he claimed this nationality, quote again, with a kind of fervor 
that suggested a desperate compensation for some deep unspoken suffering, end of quote. Generally, during this period, and the period we refer to is the 60s through to the early 90s, that's 1960s to 1990s, Douglas renounced their dual heritage and chose to subsume their identity into the ancestral group to which their phenotype subscribed. There were no attempts on the parts of Douglas to employ any lexical items which signal ethnic affiliation. That is, to employ words used by any ethnic group to project an identity. There was, however, a general shift in the linguistic and cultural behavior of Douglas after 1995. This year is particularly important because it records the ascension of the first perceived Indian political party and Indian prime minister. With this shift in the balance of power, Indic terms once relegated to specific domains and in the company of like interests came to the forefront and began to appear in print and electronic media. The term Dogla and the person it stood to represent were now presented as a new way of interpreting self. Douglas employed the term to affirm their identity as well as to raise the level of consciousness about the presence of Douglas within the society. In 2004, a private entrepreneur launched a campaign that proposed that Douglas were the only individuals capable of bridging the gap between two major races and as such, the only solution to quell the ethnic tensions that were resurfacing as a direct result of the shifts in the balance of power in 1995 and then again in 2000, 2001 and 2002. It was felt that if doglarization were encouraged, then citizens would not be unable to deploy the race card in their contestations for access to resources and patronage. Thousands of jerseys were printed with the logo Race Busters on the front and either D-I-T-A, an acronym for Dogla is the answer, or Be Wise Doglarize on the back. These jerseys were distributed throughout Trinidad and Guyana, where there is also a large number of Doglas. Additionally, some Doglas have attempted to align their speech to their Indic relations by employing terms which their Indian relatives use to signal their Indic identity. In particular, words within the semantic domains of kinship, kitchen, insult, and taboo replaced commonly used Trinidadian English Creole equivalent terms in some contexts. To draw an example, the term Janjat, which is the Indic term for confusion, has now replaced the Trinidadian English Creole equivalent commerce, itself a retention from French, in the speech of some Indians and Douglas alike. The fact that this term is consciously used, although alternative forms are available, is an indication that a conscious attempt is being made to connect with an Indic identity. Yet another tendency is a convenient appropriation of the term Dogla as a metaphor. In September 2008, for instance, at the launch of a bi-monthly magazine Dogla by a group of young persons of varying ethnic backgrounds, led by a Dogla executive producer, stated that the aim of their magazine is to celebrate Trinidad and Tobago's perfect mix, which, to them, is captured by the term Dogla. In fact, Dogla, as redefined by them, is a mentality and not an ethnicity. The etymology of the word has no bearing on the term and does not inhibit the possibility for expression and celebration. Some Douglas argue that this is now the very essence of their existence, a complete balance with themselves and the society. Yet another example is the use of the term by laypersons of varying ethnicities to refer to any commodity that is not considered to be pure. Let me provide an example. In 2012 at my staff lunchroom, 
I learned from one Dogla female that at her house, they prepare a meal of pigeon peas, Irish potato, and chicken using a method that incorporates curry and Indian spice with stew, a preparation associated with African forms of cooking in Trinidad, but which is neither curry nor stew. This dish for them is called dogla. Interestingly, the passage of time has caused the value attached to purity to diminish in relation to the value attached to hybridity. As such, individuals who are mixed are perceived to be through representations of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. So in conclusion, we can see that Dogla identity is therefore polymorphous and adds another layered dimension to a society described by some as plural and by others as stratified. Taken together, these th statements testify to the extent to which Douglas are asserting themselves positively on the social landscape and making connections with the larger society. This affirmation and connection, however, is a post-independence realization since circumstances prior to independence led to Douglas alienating themselves from the society to the extent that they subsume their identity in one or other of the dominant identities. I thank you for your time.